welcome to Center Stage. I'm Crystal, not Donna. Unfortunately, Donna had to go and do something, some family matters urgently. So Donna, I hope you're okay and I hope you're watching this. Um, happy to be here uh, in replacement of you. Today, we're going to be talking about something very, very interesting. For me, passion is theater. So it's always lovely to talk about the magic behind the scenes. Now, what magic do we have today? Shakespeare magic. So. Why don't we introduce my wonderful guest today, who is going to talk about being the director and a professor at UH. How about that double bill, huh? He can talk and act and direct. So let's introduce Professor Paul Mitri from the universe, uh, UH, like if you will, theater and dance department, yeah. professor in uh, voice, movement, Shakespeare. Stage combat. Ooh, yeah, I like yeah. that one. I get all the fun stuff. Yeah. Come on, give me more. Oh. <laughs> when you're an actor uh, yourself. Uh, yeah. You're a SAG member. Yeah. You were the, mm -hmm. uh, you created the Seattle Shakespeare Festival? Yeah, I was the principal founder of, of Seattle Shakes long ago. I actually started it right out of grad school. I was at the University of Washington, and I still had money left over from um, a slightly illegal student loan. <laughs> So, uh, who has used, money used, left <laughs> over in theater? <laughs> I, I didn't eat that year. So, okay, hope yeah. it, was, it was worth it, right? It was good. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so uh, Seattle Shakespeare Festival started in 1991 and still going strong. It's, a, it's, it's uh, kind of the premier um, classical theater uh, north of Ashland. How do you start a festival? That's fascinating. Uh, well, for, and that's another topic, like uh, in that show. It's, but it's, a, it's, it's kind of um, indicative of, of how, how do you create, create art, you know? So I saw uh, a need, I saw a, a niche. Right. There really wasn't a lot of Shakespeare being done in Seattle at that, really? that time. Uh, the Seattle Rep would do a show every, maybe every other year or so. Uh -huh. There was a theater called Intamon that was the classical theater, but they had actually started to do more Chekhov and more contemporary things. Right. So they hadn't touched the Shakespeare in a while. And, Huh. Um, so I just kind of saw that, and coming out of grad school, I had just done a season right. at Utah Shakes and said, hey, we, we, sh we should be working on that. And I know a lot of actors that they want to work yeah, on Shakespeare. Yeah, who doesn't want to? So you could get them to, to work cheaply, you know. <laughs> get the um, hungry, starving actors. Yeah, oh, yeah, because Shakespeare's Shakespeare, great to work it's with. so you know? rich. It's wonderful. Yes. So for, for two years, I actually just produced on my own. I just kind of tried to do almost everything uh, um, on my own. I remember driving uh, Shuttle Express to, to go to the, the airport. I would drive that all night long, then basically get two hours of sleep, come back, rehearse, try and get one more hour of sleep, drive for another 10 to 12 hours and do that. So. What was your first Shakespeare play? Uh, that I ever that did. The, no, oh, for, for the, the for mm -hmm, the for that. Well, the, when I produced on my own, we did uh, Romeo and Juliet. Okay. And we actually, it's actually very similar to the Baz Luhrmann one, but How it was so? 10 years before. Okay. Uh, we set it in modern times. All right, I and, love um, that. And kind of changed, you know, changed it up to to kind of have this. Uh, it was kind of more of a yuppies and punk type type of. Cool. Uh, type I of thing. really love that type it of a fun. modern interpretation. It was it was, it was a, a lot of fun. You it know, gave us a, a lot of freedom to do, you know, whatever. Um, uh, I remember cleaning blood off the back wall that we had to do <laughs> when we, you know, because. Um, uh, Mercutio, you know, uh, gets shot by Tybalt instead oh. of, of, of stab. So we had, you know, that that kind of stuff. And it was actually Romeo and Juliet and violence is actually an interesting thing because later on uh, during Seattle Shakespeare, we would use that play to bring anti-violence programs oh, to the, the high schools. Right. So you know, it isn't just oh great, let's right. do a show with you know, a lot of violence, but it's also being able to use Shakespeare as a as a tool to teach. Uh, uh, certain things that, that society needs to. So have you always combined the concept of education and theater and performance, or is this just something innate that you I like to it, kind I, of carry out? I think it. I think it kind of has to do it, especially with Shakespeare, because you you have to learn how to do it. It, mm. it doesn't tend to come naturally. And so, how do the younger generations? take that play and what do they get out of it? Because mm -hmm. that's very difficult in yeah. translation. I mean, Sha you know, Shakespeare said the whole idea is to hold the mirror up to nature. So hmm. in any time that I think about a play, it's trying to say, well, what do we want to say with it? 
you know, specifically, right. Right. not just, oh, let's set it on the moon because that would be fun. But you know, if you're so, going to make a concept, you try to go all out with it and try to say, if this is what it means, what, how does that change all other choices within it? Twelfth Night's a kind of a good example. Yeah, so of that, why, that was my perfect segue. So why Twelfth Night and why? What's your concept of this one? Uh, Twelfth Night, see, this is actually a production that I did way back in 1996 for Seattle Shakespeare. Okay. And uh, we toured it up to Whidbey Island and did it in, uh, in Seattle. And I later did the same, um, same concept in Cairo, Egypt, when I was teaching at the American University in Cairo. So I know set it. In the in Egypt? Or uh, set no, no, in set in the, 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 the way that, that the we did, did this. Okay. So the way, way we do it is um, uh, I was heavily influenced by the movie Strictly Ballroom. So it's Are you a of, dancer yourself? Uh, I, was, I was. I was a dance major. You can tango? When really? First, when I first went to, to the UW, yeah. Oh. And then I changed over to, to theater. Me so. too. I did the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. It's great. great. I mean, they go together. Right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. of course. And UH is theater and, and dance. dance. Right? Yeah. It's so all even related. Better. Yeah. Right. It, was, it was one of the reasons I, I, I wanted to come here, is you, you had ah, the, the combination of Right, yeah. right. Okay. So, uh, so dancing. So strictly ballroom, dance. yeah. Um, so. Uh, so we set Illyria in Twelfth Night as this mystical, um, I mean, Shakespeare's geography was not so good. Can you recap for people who aren't as familiar with Shakespeare's stories, in a nutshell, what is the long line for Twelfth Night? Uh, <laughs> well, for, for, for Twelfth Night, um, like the plot line, you could kind of say like many of his uh, uh, twins get separated and uh, come back together at the end. So that's kind of what, what happens. In the meantime, they all find true love. Right. But then so there's a lot of good. gender crossing and humor in, in falling in love with the wrong person yeah. and all that kind of stuff, yeah. right? Well, for, so for me and for this play and for this particular uh, concept of, of the production, to me it had to do with what is Illyria. And Illyria to me is this glitzy uh, uh, world, kind of looks like a, a you know, 40s MGM musical type of thing, okay. where it's all about the, the, the glitz of it, you know, the glamour or whatever. It's people that are in love with the idea of being in love. Uh, they don't really know what real love is until Viola gets shipwrecked into this place. For us, shipwrecked, she just kind of lands in it, a little okay. bit like um, uh, Wizard of Oz. Right. And, and, um, but she's the catalyst. She's the, the instrument that kind of allows Orsino and allows Olivia to say, oh, that's what love is. That's what it really is about. And they really start to feel something. Whereas all before, they're just professing to be in love, or Olivia's kind of professing to be in mourning. Huh. Uh, you just don't really believe it until these guys come along, um, Sebastian and, and Viola, the twins. Right. And Viola especially says, you know, um, uh, uh, Olivia, Olivia says, well, you know, what would you do if you were in love? And then she has this beautiful willow cabin speech where she says, make me a willow cabin at your gate. You know, and it's just the most beautiful thing in the world. You know? And he does it. And yeah, uh, you know, uh, Viola, dressed as right, a boy, right. says this, and Olivia goes, "Oh, that's love," you know, and fall, falls in love with him, her. What's that context to modern day youths? I mean, do you think the younger generation now also have kind of a misconception of love? Because you know, I talk to my son. I know he's younger; he's 16. But you know, they say everything is so casual now, and nobody really has a real concept of of genuine true love it sounds corny but well, what how do we take that with us today what I would what I would say is is that plays into why is Shakespeare important Shakespeare yes. is about words and it's about language uh, Shakespeare's working vocabulary was 30,000 words the modern you know normal American vocabulary is eight <laughs> Maybe fifth, talking about a rap song, right? Exactly, exactly. And that's what the there's a linguistic theory that you know basically says if you don't have the words for it, you can't really experience it. Well, what are we gonna do with Trump? He's got less. Sorry, <laughs> I heard that knock. Um, yeah, I mean that. I think if you look at at how uh, President Obama speaks and the the, the amount of you know words that, that he uses, just, yeah. Yes. and it is it just kind of dumbs everything down and simplifies everything. And I, I think that, that that's really true as as you're saying with uh, with the younger generation and the idea of being in love. Uh, I think Shakespeare, you can look back and look at these words and go, oh, that's what love is. 
it isn't just, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you, or, or I don't really love you, but hey, let's you know, hook right. up. Uh, but instead, it's, it's these, these, this, this deepness, you know, read the, read the sonnets, you know? Yeah, read how it's deep a lost art, are. isn't it? it, it yeah. Do you ever see Captain Fantastic? No. Oh, please do. I, will. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I don't want to off sidetrack <laughs> here, but really, because they go off and they they are so well read, living in the forest, growing up, not going into a normal social environment. But the teenage boy falls in love with a girl, and he starts ranting these these philosophical um, sayings. And the little girl, this young modern girl, is like, "What the?" You know. <laughs> and it's really quite interesting what words can mean. Yeah or yeah. the lack thereof. Well, and words are powerful, which yes. is as we're finding the, the whole you know, Twitter gate thing is, is yes. just, you know, how you use words, they can wound or they can heal. Your choice. And is it a loaded word or is it oversimplified where it's lacking so much depth? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Do you have a favorite part of Twelfth Night? Oh, all of it. Um, uh, probably the... Without the, giving away the <laughs> story? <laughs> um, probably when when uh the scene with olivia and and viola um is really really just beautiful i think i think the poetry is is fabulous uh how our actors are doing it is a lot of fun um and then later on i think part of that fun too is you get to see them later on too after olivia falls in love with viola and then she's there and she's like mm try to hold hold his hand you know and he's like no oh, no 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 <laughs> right. i'm a servant you're a princess. No, you know. Like but even the cross-gender thing, I think that's, I find that very, very relevant today. You know, um, does, does it, or, or maybe not, because Shakespeare in times, was he before his times in terms of talking about, you know, um, men and women and your identities and who, who you think you're attracted to. But today, this whole neutral gender thing going on is mm -hmm. a very, very different concept. So you say you think you're in love with someone. You think you're in love with the opposite sex, but you're not. So are you, in fact, I don't know if, if those issues come up in it. They they are, and and if you want to stress them, you certainly can. Right. Uh, I think uh, Hawaii Shakespeare uh, did Twelfth Night last summer, and, and I, I think that they dealt uh, with it more from that that kind of modern uh, right. standpoint. Okay. For us, and setting it in this time period, yeah. I think that that begs other. Um, certain choices to to be made but we do talk i mean in a way we have uh, festy the clown and we've chosen it to be more androgynous um, in a way festy is almost like this is what viola could become if she ends up just staying right. in illyria if illyria is such is almost a trap and just you know she just can't get out of it so viola's kind of whole struggle is why don't i just tell people i'm a girl you know, right. Why don't I In just, this photo, just is that Viola? Uh, no, that's o Olivia. Olivia, uh, pl okay. Played by uh, Emily Hoadley, and right. that is Festy, played by Rachel Lueno. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, yeah. So you you can see the the clown. Yeah, we're going much more with a uh, you know uh, androgynous, um, but the Festy kind of then also has the ability to kind of see. Uh, see what's underneath all the glitz as well. Right. Festy as the clown is able to say this is what's really going on, you know, and sees through Viola's disguise and right. is kind of going, I know what you are. That's I the know, brilliance I know of Shakespeare, though. You always have one character who's going to spill it mm -hmm. if you can read between the lines mm -hmm. and not. We're going to take a quick break um, and a lot of interesting stuff with Twelfth Night. So I'm going to pick your brain a little bit more after this. And don't go away because we are going to talk and dig more into Twelfth Night at the University of Hawaii. Aloha and Happy New Year. It's 2017. Please keep up with me on Power Up Hawaii, where Hawaii comes together to talk about a clean and just energy future. Please join me on Tuesdays at 1 o'clock. Mahalo. Hey, has your signal just been taken over or am I supposed to be here? This is Andrew, the security guy, your co-host on Hibachi Talk. Please join us every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, I'm Marianne Sasaki from Life in the Law on ThinkTech Hawaii. I'm delighted to tell everybody, I'm so excited, I'm going to Washington to march with women on Saturday, January 21st. It's going to be a huge, huge event. And I think we're doing something in Hawaii too, aren't we? Yes, we are. Here on Oahu, we're going to be at the Capitol uh, starting at 8 a.m.
back here on Center Stage with Professor Paul Mitri talking about his directorial tarot uh, performance upcoming um, performance of Twelfth Night at the University of Hawaii Theater. Now, Twelfth Night, if everybody knows, is a Shakespearean play. Um, but Paul, your take on this is to combine uh, ballroom dancing, which I think is a really interesting combo. Now, I know you have a little dance background, but why did you choose specifically ballroom dancing, and how do you think that works with this play specifically? I think, um, I think uh, especially like setting it in a ballroom and, and using the ballroom dance, there's so much uh, etiquette to it. There's so much, um, you know, kind of... A glamour to that, you know, elegance to it too, right? And at the same time, though, is what is underneath it? Where's the passion underneath it? You know, if you think of a tango, it's yeah. it's technically brilliant, mm -hmm. but it also has the the reality of the feeling under it too. And that to me is that that dichotomy that I think Shakespeare should have. Absolutely, you got to blend technique with passion. Sure, you know? but my uh, my in interpretation of, of Twelfth Night often is because it's shipwrecked, and so it's on an island, and yeah. people are in shreds, and they're kind of like not really in the best threads. Yeah. So how did you turn that, that into? Me, that to me is Tempest, you know? So oh, okay, it's like, true, you know, you true. Know, ev everybody's like that. In this one, it's really on only Viola. And it's, you know, let's face it, it's a pretty flimsy plot point. She goes, oh, uh, I'll dress as a guy and serve serve the Duke, you know? Okay. So it's it, uh, it, it doesn't really hold up, you know? Uh, so for us also, it's kind of, well, Illyria is this strange world, you know, and where you can kind of be like, didn't I just see you as the captain, and now you're doing this over here? So it's um, in, it's a little bit like like Oz, I think. In that, in those. those uh, do you think this is a, a particularly musical piece? Is that why you brought this into it? Yeah, I think um, Twelfth Night's kind of the most musical of all of, of Sha it? Shakespeare's plays. Is this the one where they have the famous line, "Is music the food of love? Yep, play on." that's ah. the first line, oh. very first line of okay, "Music be the food of it. love, play on." That's yeah. one of my favorites. Yeah, and uh, and Festy sings three songs in it, you know. Okay. Um, could have been four. Uh, so there's you know, plenty of, of music in there. And that, that for us also is kind of indicative of, of this world. Um, uh, so the way that we're, we're using it too, so we use music and dance as kind of transitions between the scenes, either to help the characters get out of a scene or to show the characters coming back into a scene is to use dance as a, a metaphor. Did that. you find it difficult to use your cast in their talents uh, with dance and music and voice in that combination now? Um, you know, we're an educational institution, so that's that's our job is, is to educate. Right. And I have absolutely am, am indebted to Mike Romney, who's the choreographer. So he's an MFA student in the dance program, uh -huh. and I, he teaches ballroom for us okay. at, at the school. So I said, hey, Mike, would you want to choreograph that? And then he uh, he leapt at it, and he has been working so hard. Um, uh, many of the the actors had had some dance, but not a lot in in many cases. Um, and we have uh, at least one dancer who doesn't have a lot of uh, uh, theater background, and she has you know, right, thrown herself over, right. you know totally into that. So that's also why I, I love doing the show right now. Is it allows different sides of our department to to come together and, right. and uh, work together. Um, but some of our some of our actors, you know, they are so versatile. They can. They're absolutely triple threats. So wow, you know, watch them hear. and 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 enjoy their work. What do you think? I know it's hard to speak on behalf of them, but what do you think their biggest challenge was during this process with you in particular? Dealing with me? Yeah. No. Oh, <laughs> no. oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. um, that too. Uh, you know, our our students are really really busy, mm. and and especially. Um, you know, if they're good, they're in high demand. So they are really constantly trying to balance. Um, well, okay, um, the, um, Rachel, who plays Festy, mm -hmm. she just did Elephant Man at Manoa Valley. Okay. She teaches two classes for us, wow. beginning acting. She's carrying a full load of classwork also. Right. And if they're my classes, that means you're doing a lot of other scenes and a lot of memorization. Right. Um, uh, and she's also, you know, being... Yeah, That's her, right? Is. That's Rachel. Right. Um, so she's also being asked to be in, you know, X number of other scenes for directing students and, 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 and all of that. Well, isn't that wonderful? I mean, it's, that's the real world. If you're good, you're going to be busy. That's I, ideally. You do, and that's, that's kind of why, uh, that's part of her job, is to learn to balance all of this. Right. You know? And that's, and in theater, a lot of times when it rains, it pours. Yes. You get three shows at the same time, and then you go months or years without getting any. 
anything. Yeah, you know? yeah, the drought. And in that, in that meantime, you got to still be training. You right. can't just, you know, say, oh, I didn't get any work. So keep learning new skills, keep learning new, new skills. And so for this one, the dancing especially, Mike is really, uh, you know, taking her through her paces for the, for the dance part of it. And it also gives her a chance to show off her, uh, of her vocal work, which actually in Elephant Man, uh, we had used her as a vocalist in that too. So okay. again, it's like you learn some skills in this show, you apply them to the next one. Yeah. You learn some skills here, you apply them to the next one. And isn't it wonderful to be able to see such talent in Hawaii? We have an amazingly talented stable of, of, of actors here. And um, the question is just how do we let the world know about it? Yeah. How do we get, get people to, to, to understand that? To, to see them. Um, you know, we've rejoined the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival, and we had co-hosted it last year with Chaminade. Okay. And, and so we were able to show um, our Hawaiian theater program. We were able to show uh, um, a musical, you know, some scenes that we had done from Sunday in the Park with George. Oh, our nice. students competed. Uh, our student, uh, Nathiel Nimi, won the national directing competition at the Kennedy Center. Wow. We have great, great students. And it's, people don't know about it. No, That's the crazy yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I really think, if I can get on the soapbox for, you know, for a second. Yes, uh, and com Compare the, the arts to, to theater, you know, or uh, the arts to, to sports. You know, you, read, you pick up the paper and you see about, about student athletes mm -hmm. in that, and they get, you know, a lot of great coverage to it, too. And money. The, and sponsorships. <laughs> these students that, that you'll see on stage, you might very well see them in a movie. You know, they might become the next Matt Damon. They might, you know, be the next Angelina Jolie. Um, they're they're that talented. That's so wonderful. So, and then that's just so inspiring too to know that you know you're in a small community, small island, but you've got such versatility and talent here. Wonderful. That it's so wonderful underestimated. Talent. Yeah. Yeah. And it's and you know they don't have the. Um, the kind of head start that their peers do if, if their peers are studying in New York or, or LA or Chicago. Um, uh, so our students have to work doubly hard because yeah. once they go there, they kind of have to start from scratch. You right. know? And um, but we've got some students that are doing some wonderful stuff. Wonderful and I'm glad stuff. you as a professor or as a director, as a creative person is continually being inspired by people and, and works that you want to work on, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, what inspires yeah. you to keep going and, and creating new projects? I like a challenge. Yeah. Um, we just did uh, Elephant Man at Manoa Valley, right. and that, that had been on my, my bucket list because you know, it's one of those things you look at and you go, that looks hard. I should do that. <laughs> think? I should probably try that <laughs> okay. then. You know? if, it's, if it's hard, it's worth doing. Yeah, you know? there's, sure. There's the just... struggle itself, right? Yeah, yeah. What so... are some other things on your bucket list that we should know about? Um, 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 well, there's, Give me there's... one. Give me one you really want to do that you haven't done yet. As a director or as an actor? Oh, two questions. Well, we got, yeah, okay. got that. Or, or both. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Cerno de Bergerac. Oh, okay. Cerno, that uh, hasn't been done in Hawaii, huh? Not in a long, not, not since I've been here. And um, my colleague, uh, the late uh, Glenn Cannon, he was fabulous. He was so wonderful. And that's um, after seeing uh, the company that, that, that we started, All the World's a Stage, uh, one of the first things he said to me was, you need to do Cyrano. And so, yeah. just to, to honor him, I would like at some okay. point to, to be as an actor or director that. for that one. Well, I'd probably do both. How do you feel about self-directing and acting in the same production? Um, you see it in films, and it doesn't work often. Yeah, it. Uh, I think it depends. I don't know why it doesn't work in film. They have a lot more because money. they have huge heads. <laughs> they have a ton more money. They're though. too they have the obsessed with themselves, yeah. and, and that's a thing. Too much money gives you too much absolutely. room. Absolutely, it and can. That, it can. Right? It's dangerous. Um, I think in. in in theater, it, it depends, and there are certainly some productions that I'd say, yeah, there's no way that I would want, want to, to direct myself in. Um, but some productions, the character that I play, like there was one called Inventing Van Gogh, okay. and I played uh, Patrick, the artist, not Van Gogh. So I was able, Patrick spends most of his time watching. Okay. You know, so Shut in a way right. you're going, well, right. I'm already watching. I'm just watching from a slightly different angle. Mm. Um, I've also found that with many of uh, some of the people in town that, that I keep working with, uh, Rob Duvall especially, oh. that we have a wonderful working relationship that, you know, in a way that we can just kind of direct each other, you know. 
And as uh, it's that comfortable. It absolutely. We share the pretty much the same vocabulary. And certainly, as I'm training students then to come up and be my colleagues. Right. Uh, for instance, we did proof for all the worlds a stage, and there were four people in the show: myself and, and Rachel and Alex Monroe and Hannah Shower Galli. And we basically said we're going to uh, direct ourselves. So we called it collabor acting. So how do you come to constructively criticize each other? And we, you to have to leave the ego at the door. You just have to check easier it. Easier said check than done, though, there. right? No. Uh, you know, if, if there are people that you admire and there are people that, that you respect, yes. then, um, and it's something that I tried to teach my students anyway, is that never be a diva. The world yes. has way too many divas. Yeah, I totally you know? agree. So there, there's just no room for that in the rehearsal hall. And it's theater, about you don't, the it doesn't breed divas anyway, usually. I've, I've seen like some. Oh, I had, really? to, I had to tell some stories about some at the, not here, I, but uh, yeah, in, in my, my work at, at other theaters, I told some stories uh, to my auditioning class recently yeah. about, about some of those. Yeah. Oh, okay. But there's, yeah, and nice I said, personality too. You know, please never be a diva. Um, there's just no reason for it. It's about the work, you know. Yes. Uh, Stanislavski said, um, you know, love the art in yourself, not yourself in the art. Yeah. So if you can do that. Um, then I should be able to go, yeah, tell me what you think. I may not agree, and right. that's, that's certainly but fine. But you uh, welcome that feedback. But yeah, and I might go, I didn't think of it that way. Let me right. try that. Let me yeah. see, see what well, happens. That's important. You know? As a person, too, because you're always growing and you're always morphing into different characters, which is so fun in your, in your career. Absolutely. So if there are some young people, well, not, not young, I mean, anyone who um, is aspiring to be a performer, mm -hmm. um, what are some tips you would give them based on your experience in front and behind the scenes and, you know, throughout your creative life? Um, What's the way to go about well, it? Well, what, what I tell my students, it's about you have to become aware of yourself first. You got to know exactly how you come across. Uh, you have to be willing to use your own feelings mm -hmm. to make it real for yourself. Um, and I think a lot of actors, partially because what we see on TV, uh, we do see a lot of fake stuff. You know, oh, God, and a lot yeah. of and a lot of that gets <laughs> held up as props. You know, it's like, oh, this is really good. So you have to kind of have your yeah. own work ethic yeah. and your own bar, you know, that, that right. you say, I'm going to work to that. I'm not going to try to bring that down here. Good point. You know? And be real to yourself. But, Paul, before we forget, let's remind everybody when this upcoming performance of Twelfth Night is. Uh, Twelfth Night opens January 27th That's on a Friday, right? Friday night. Okay. It is, uh, it'll be at 7 o'clock that Friday, and then two shows the following, uh, that next Saturday, the 28th, at 2 and at 7, and then the following Friday, February 3rd at 7, and then the 4th at 2 and at 7 also. This is not at the theater. This is at the, the campus ballroom, ballroom okay. because it takes place in a ballroom. Yay, so lots of dancing and singing. Yeah. And if food be the love... No. If music, if music be, the be the food, food of, of love. love. Lay, on. Lay on. Thank you so much, oh. Professor, for being here, and good Thank luck. Thank you. Thanks so much. God, I screwed up on that line. Yeah.